weight landed on my big toe. When that happened, as I was going up the stairs and my weight landed on my big toe, I felt a snap. You see, what happened was my big toe snapped like you'd snap a hot dog. And I looked down at my right foot, and I remember I was wearing white socks. And the reason why I remember I was wearing white socks was because my white socks were becoming red as my sock was filling up with blood. Now, I have to be honest with you, the first thought that I had was not about my sock filling up with blood. The first thought that I had was not about my uh, pain that I was experiencing. The first thought I had was, oh, shoot, I'm not going to be able to walk Elizabeth down the aisle. And we had this really special father-daughter dance set up in a week. And how am I going to do that with this foot the way that it is? Well, Daryl carted me off to the emergency room at Sisters Hospital. They gave me some great pain medication, sewed up my toe, put me in a boot, and sent me on my way. Now, a couple years prior to that, a patient had made this cane for me. It's a beautiful cane, and I remembered it, so I learned to walk with the cane because I was walking with a limp. I was walking with a limp. Well, the week went on, and the big day approached. If we show the next picture, you're going to see Daryl and I walking into the reception, and there I am with my cane walking into the reception. I was able to walk Elizabeth down the aisle, achieve goal number one. And then goal number two, we're at the reception, and it was called the father and daughter dance came up. And so I danced with my daughter, Elizabeth, which was my second goal, and you'll see that in the second picture. Now, many of you probably don't know this song, but at the time, it was a very popular song to have played at the father and daughter dance. It was called Butterfly Kisses. And when they sang that song, or that song was played by the DJ, about midway through the song, everybody started tearing up, kind of getting emotional started crying. Now, unbeknownst to the people at the reception, Elizabeth and I talked to the DJ, and we said halfway through the song, when everybody starts crying, we want you to flip it to a second song. And if you show the next picture, the next song was Chubby Checkers and the Twist. You see, if you're a Martinki, you got to know how to do the twist. That's what we do in our family. And so we did the twist, and actually, if you go to the next picture, you just don't do the twist, but you got to get down low when you do the twist. Well, I was able to do that with my broken toe. I paid for it a few days later, but two goals were achieved. Now, why, why am I telling you this story? What does this have anything to do? Well, can you think of a biblical character who walked with a limp? Yell it out. Who else? Another from the Old Testament, a biblical character who walked with a limp. Jacob. That's, that was good. That was the king that that happened to. But Jacob walked with a limp. If you go to Genesis 32, you'll read the story. Now, if you remember, Jacob was a twin of Esau. They were born to Rebekah and Isaac. And Jacob did a stupid thing. He deceived his father, and he stole from his brother. When that happened, Esau got pretty ticked off. So Esau was planning to kill Jacob. So Rachel, his mother, tells Jacob, you got to get out of here. So Jacob takes off to Haran, and he lives with his mother's brother, Laban. And he lives there for 20 years. He has a family, kids, grows livestock, and really becomes quite prosperous. At the end of that time, he says, I want to go back and see what's going on in my relationship with Esau. So he starts traveling back to his home country. And as he's arriving at his home country, he has this thought. He sends his family and children and livestock ahead of him over a stream ahead of him. 
but he stays back. We pick that up in Genesis 32, verse 24. Let's, let's read that, where, where, where it says that Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. The man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. What, what does Jacob mean? Who knows? What does Jacob mean? He deceives. See, he deceived his brother. Jacob means he deceives or he grasps the heel. Appropriately named. Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet was spared. The sun rose above him, and as he passed Peniel, and he was limping, because of his hip. Well, today we start a new series on leadership. And the topic that I have today is leadership pain or walking, walking with a limp. And my message today has three simple points for those of you who might want to take notes. There's just three simple points. Point number one, you are a leader. Yeah, yeah, you are a leader. You might say, Dave, I don't lead an organization. I don't lead people at work. I, I, I'm not a leader. No, no, no. You are a leader. If we look at, look at Wikipedia, the definition of a leader is a leader is one who influences others. A leader is one who influences others. You see, you influence other people. Maybe you're a parent, you influence your children. Maybe you're married, you influence your spouse. Maybe you have friends, you influence your peer group. Maybe you're in school, you influence your castmates. Maybe you're at work, you influence the people who are at work with you. You even have opportunity at work to influence your boss or to lead your boss. There's a term for that, it's called leading up. You see... We are leaders because we influence other people. Your ability to influence others does not depend on your job description, doesn't depend on your social status, it doesn't depend on the number of friends you have or how big your bank, bank account is or whether you speak well or whether you can't speak at all. Your ability to lead is based on your influence and your faith in Jesus Christ. You see, Paul knew this when he shared with Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Paul tells P Timothy, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Someone needs to hear this verse today. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. You can set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. You see, we often think that leadership is bossing people around. Leadership is controlling other people, or maybe even manipulating other people for our own good. That's not leadership. Some leaders behave that way. That's not leadership. You see, in reality, we really can't control anyone else. The only person we can really control is ourselves. And so we need to harness the ability to control our speech, our conduct, our love, our faith, and our walk of purity. But, but how does that look like? How does that look like in reality? How do we display that in our walk? Well, let me ask a question. 
Has anybody ever heard of a man named Scott Harrison? He started an organization called Charity Water. Has anybody ever heard of Scott Harrison or Charity Water? Okay. Let me, let me just take a moment and read for you just a two or three sentence bio that if you went to the organization Charity Water and, and you looked up the founder, Scott Harrison, they'd read, you'd read this little bio. It's only two or three sentences. Let me read it to you. After a, in, uh, after a decade of indulging in the darkest vices as a nightclub promoter. See, Scott would set up parties, spending thousands upon thousands of dollars, drugs, alcohol, you name it. He would provide it at these parties. Famous athletes, actors, actresses, famous people. He then declared spiritual, moral, and emotional bankruptcy. He hit his low. And then he spent two years on a hospital ship off the coast of Liberia. He learned the effects of dirty drinking water firsthand. And then he came back to New York City. And he wanted to do something for the 1.1 billion people who didn't have clean water at that time. I don't know, did you even think of clean water when you turned on your faucet this morning to shave or shower or wash your hands or splash some water on your face to help you wake up? I know I didn't. But over 1.1 billion people without clean water. Well, I could talk to you about Scott Harrison. I could talk to you about the leadership skills of Scott Harrison. I could tell you about how he grew that organization. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you about a person who works with Charity Water. Really a great leader at Charity Water. Someone who's influenced many people for good at Charity Water. As a matter of fact, instead of telling you about him, I'd like to introduce you to him. So maybe we could run that clip and we could learn about this great leader at Charity Water whose name is Lori. Lori is his name. Birthdays, we all have them. Some of us love the attention. And some of us, well, wish we could skip the whole thing. No matter how you feel about your big day, you can use your birthday to change the world. Meet Lori. I'm Lori. For his sixth birthday, Lori asked people to donate $6 instead of giving him gifts. His campaign raised $2,386. All the money went to Rwanda to help people. That's how it works. Your gifts become gifts for others. Friends and family donate to your campaign, and 100% of the money you raise goes to water projects around the world. And then we show you exactly where it went and who it helped. Whether you're turning 36 or 26 or even just 6, you can use your birthday to change the world. That's a birthday you'll remember forever. Visit charitywater.org slash birthdays to pledge yours now. What an influencer. What a leader at six years of age. There's so much that we could learn from a leader like that. How can we use our lives to influence others? There are hundreds of people in Rwanda today that are receiving clear, clean water because of Lori. But let's not stop there. Let's move on. Our time is short. And so point number one, you are a leader. Point number two, you lead with a limp. You lead with a limp, just like me. You say, oh no, Dave, I don't limp. I'm young and healthy. I don't limp. No, you have a limp. You see, our limp are those things that we struggle with. They're the pain in our life. They're the things that mark our humanity, things, the frailties of our life, the faults of our life, the fears of our life, even the sins 
of our life. See, those are our limp. It's, it's common to all of us. I've shared with you before from this stage that my limp is that of anxiety. At times when I feel the stress of life bear down upon me in a difficult time, I struggle with anxiety. But that's not my only limp. I have other limps. Now, I know you don't struggle with these limps, but one of the limps that I struggle with is criticizing others. There are times where I can be critical. I remember as a, as a child, my mother would say to me, Ooh, Dave, your tongue is so sharp. Your tongue is so sharp. Don't be so critical. See, as a leader, I'm not perfect. And as a leader, you're not perfect. But you don't need me to tell you that. You know that you have imperfections. You have faults. You have fears. You have frailties. And you too, like me, have sins. But here's the good news. Here's the punchline that you don't want to forget. Your sins, your frailties, your faults, your fears... They do not disqualify you from serving God. They do not disqualify you from serving God. Not at all. We can look at some biblical giants. We can talk about Abraham, who lied about his wife to protect his life. We could go on from, we talked about Jacob, right? Jacob deceived his father. Not only did he deceive his father, but he stole from his brother. How about Moses, who murdered a man? How about David, who sinned with a man's wife, sleeping with her? And if that wasn't bad enough, he had the man murdered. How about Peter who walked with Jesus for three years? Three years he walked side by side. It's said that Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And yet after three years, at the time of the crucifixion, when Jesus needed Peter the most, what did he do? He denied him multiple times. Not one time, not two times, multiple times. Or Paul, who thought he was serving God, so he chased down Christians, imprisoned them persecuted them, and even gave approval to their death. The Bible is full of them. People who walk with a limp. People like you and people like me. Imperfect people who limp in life. But you know, a limp is really important. It really is. You know, a limp teaches us to trust God A limp teaches us to trust God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. A limp reminds us that we are not perfect. We need to trust in God. A limp also marks our relationship with God and keeps us close to him. We've already read for verses 24 and 28 of Genesis 32, but let me read them again. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Then the man said to him, Your name is is no longer Jacob, which means his deceiver, but Israel, which means he struggles with God. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. See, there's an important lesson in here. And the lesson is this. It's okay to struggle and wrestle with God. You may have thought it's not good to wrestle with God. No, 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 no. It's okay to wrestle 
with God. Bring to God your faults, your frailties, your failures, your sin. Bring it to God. Wrestle with him like Jacob did. There's a whole nation that's named Israel today. It means he wrestled with God. It's okay to wrestle with God. And you know what you're going to learn? When you wrestle with God, you really end up wrestling with yourself, your faults, your insecurities, your worries, your fears, your frailties. And that's okay. There's nothing the matter with that. But there's another reason why a limp is important in our lives. You see, a limp can only be seen when you're walking. Yeah. You see, if you want to move forward in your Christian walk, if you want to grow closer to God, if you want to get to know him in a more intimate way, if you want to grow in any way, shape, or form in leadership or in the influence of other people, there's something you have to realize. People will see your limp. People will see your limp. You see, if you don't want people to see your limp, if you don't want people to know the imperfections that you carry in your life, don't walk forward. Sit back. Relax. Take it easy in life. You see, when I'm sitting, you can't tell I got a limp. When I'm sitting, you don't know I'm limping. However, if you desire to grow, if you desire to get to know this eternal God in a deeper way, if you desire to grow by his spirit, or get to know him, or move forward, or lead, or inspire others for good, or do anything of value in this life to move forward in your walk with him, Accept the fact, people will see your limp. They'll see your limp. But that's okay. Because we all limp. We all limp. And that's why I have a little principle in life. Now, you may not agree with my little principle in life. That's okay. Because this principle that I live by, it's not in the Ten Commandments. It's not even in the Bible. You may not even find it in a good book. So you don't have to believe my principle. But it's a principle that I live by. Here's the principle. I personally, Dave Martinke, will only follow a leader who walks with a limp. I'll only follow a leader who walks with a limp. Why? Because a limp speaks of humanity it speaks of humility. It speaks of dependency on God. It speaks of God's redemption in a leader's life and in their influence of others. So if I'm going to follow a leader, they're going to have a limp. Well, that brings me to point number three. Point number one, you are a leader. Point number two, you walk with a limp. And point number three, where are you leading others to? It's a question for you today. Where are you leading others to? What's your destination? Or better yet, who are you leading others to? See, any good leader who's worth his or her salt knows that to be a leader or an influencer of others, you have to have a destination. You have to have a direction that you're leading towards. And so I ask you, what is the purposeful destination that you have as you lead and influence others? You know, I think I've shared before at, uh, at New Story that I'm a family physician. I've been a family doc for about 35 years. I recently retired this last December 31st. But for three years before I retired, I was the CEO of our medical practice, Primary Care of Western New York. We grew the practice over the last 22 years. 
When I was CEO, we had 46 providers, 120 employees, and four, we cared for 42,000 patients. It was a sizable organization. And when I took the helm of leadership of the organization, I really started to seek God and to ask the very important question that any leader has to ask in an organization. And that is, answer the why. Answer the why. Why does this organization exist? Keep your eyes on the purpose, the why of the organization. And so I would meet with a leadership team and we would wrestle with that question. And with that, we developed two questions. And I told our leadership team, the physicians, the providers, our staff, anyone in leadership, that when you're faced with a decision to either go this way or this way, you will ask two, decision, two questions. Two questions. Before you make a decision, you always ask two questions. A or B, ask the questions. Two questions. Question number one, what is best for the patients that we serve? Period. We're a medical practice. We care for people. What's best for the patients? Whether the decision's financial, facilities, human resource, doesn't matter what's best for the patient. We put the patient right in the center of our decision making. Second question, whether we choose A or B, which choice moves us closer to excellence? Which choice moves us closer to excellence? When you're deciding in life, for me, I want to go towards excellence. That's the destination I want to head towards. We want to go towards excellence. Now, excellence is nebulous. It's very nebulous. Excellence is something that you can't quite achieve. You reach for it, but you can't quite grab it. For example, it's like going east. You ever travel east? I'm sure you have. You're in Buffalo. You want to travel to New York City. You travel east. You're in New York City. You want to travel east? You go to London. You're in London. You want to travel east? Go to Jerusalem. You're in Jerusalem. You want to go east? Go to Bombay. You can keep going east around the world, but what happens when you get back to Buffalo? You can keep going east again. You never achieve east. It's a direction you had and you never achieve. Excellence is like that. It's something you strive for, but you can't quite obtain. Oh, Dave, that's interesting, and I understand it in the corporate world, but what does that have to do with New Story? What does that have to do with me and my, my personal walk with Jesus Christ? I'm glad you asked. What is your destination? Where are you going? Where are you leading others to? Or better yet, who are you leading others to? Reminds me of the verse in the Bible where Jesus has lived his life he was brutally crucified, dead and buried, rose from the dead, came back to be with his disciples. And before he ascended to sit at the right hand of the throne of God, he spoke some of the most important words that were ever spoken. It's Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and in earth have been given to me. All authority. No other authority. All authority given to Jesus. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's our destination. Discipleship and teaching. That's our destination. And what's our empowerment? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You don't have a destination? That's a good one to latch on to. And so as I close, I'd ask you to consider my three points this morning. Remember, you are a leader. If you hear my voice in this auditorium or online, you are a leader. As a matter of fact, you can type that in the chat. I'm a leader. Number two, you lead with a limp. But number three is a question. Where are you leading others to? Or who are you leading others to? Do you have time for one more story? Could, 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 I, could I share one more story? It was about... Four or five weeks ago, 
I was sitting in this area of the auditorium. It was a Sunday morning. Scott was on the stage. And Scott shared with us a word that he believes that God has given him for New Story for 2024. What's that word? I, I, I can't hear you from here. I'm sorry. A little louder? No, no I, you know, I, I'm hard of hearing. What's the word for 24? Create. 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 That hit me. I said, Lord, I just retired a few weeks ago. I got time on my hands. What do you want me to create? What can I create? Lord, speak to me. Speak to my heart. What can I create? It was very clear. I said, Dave, create space for God. Create space for God. And so now in my relationship with my wife, Daryl, I try and create space for God. In my relationship with my family, I desire to create space for God. In my, my relationship with my peers, I want to, my friends, I want to create space for God. And at New Story, in my relationships here, I desire to create space for God. Hey, I got an idea. How about together we take a few minutes, two minutes, and let's create some space for God. If you'd like to create space for God with me, I'd ask you to do this. First of all, get in a comfortable position. Just kind of get comfortable in your chair. And then I want you to take a deep breath. Kind of take a deep breath. Whatever stressors you have, just kind of let it go as you exhale. Maybe one more time. Some of us are a little more stressed. Just a nice deep breath and let it relax. And in your comfortable position, I'd like you to sit back and close your eyes. Yeah, close your eyes. And then I would ask that you would quiet your thoughts. Quiet your thoughts. I'm going to ask you four questions. As I ask these four questions, allow God to direct you to the answers that are best for you. Not an answer for somebody else. The answer that's best for you. Question number one is you quiet your mind and your thoughts before the Lord. Who in your life does God want you to lead or influence? Who in your life does God want you to lead or influence? Think of that person or those people. And then question number two. What is your limp? What do you struggle with? What are you wrestling with right now? And what is God saying to you right now about what you're wrestling with? Let him speak to your heart at this time. Question number three. Where are you leading others to? What is your destination? What has been your destination in your life? And what destination does God want you to have for your life? Let him speak that to you now. Last question. How can you act on the answers that God has given to you right now? In the days ahead. How can you act on those answers in the days ahead? When you're ready, you can open your eyes and you can look at me for one more brief moment. 
Some of you, it might have been the very first time that you actually heard God's voice speak to your heart in answer to those questions. If that's you, I would ask you to share that with your story group. Or if you're not a member of your story group, hunt me down after the service, or my wife, Daryl Ann, or Scott, or Lindsay, or Kim, or Neil, or Rafi, or Sarah, any one of us, Joy or Aaron, any one of us would love to hear what God has said to your heart. And so with that, I'll close. And Scott, I think you have a, a few words for us this morning.